Mark here from Talking Bass. Today we're going to look at one of the greatest bass lines laid down by one of the greatest bass players. Every Time You Go Away was originally written by Hall & Oates, but Paul Young's cover in 1985 features a fretless bass line by Pino Palladino that is a pure masterclass in melodic playing. Many of you will know of Pino's playing on another Paul Young cover of Marvin Gaye's Wherever I Lay My Hat. That's probably what you would call Pino's signature line from that, you know, fretless period. And in that line, you can really hear the Jacob Astorius influence and how Pino was able to take that style and place it in a, you know, 80s electric pop setting in much the same way as Mick Khan from Japan. Every Time You Go Away is a little bit different in that it has more of a power soul ballad feel and Pino plays around the groove with some incredible playing. It's memorable, interesting, melodic, and pretty hard to play, even if you're playing it on a, fret, uh, a fretted bass. The fills in this song are amazing and absolutely essential listening for bass players of any style. So we're going to look at the chord progression Pino had to work with, the line itself, and we'll dig a little deeper into the nuts and bolts of those fills so you can use them or create fills like them in your own playing. Now, one thing I would definitely recommend for those of you with a love for Pino is to watch Joe Hubbard's video entitled Pino Palladino Story. Joe taught Pino before and during his 80s ascent, and that video is a great insight. You learn what Pino had been practicing, how Joe helped him, and it ties nicely into some of the things that we're going to look at here that I'm going to cross-reference later. So if you want to watch that video, I'll link to it in the info below. Remember, the lesson material and tracks can all be found over at Talking Bass. Just click the link in the info below. Also, remember to like the video or subscribe to the channel. There are over 600 Talking Bass videos here on YouTube, and I release a lesson every Friday, so sign up and hit that bell to receive notifications of every release. Okay, so this song has a fairly straightforward chord progression. It's very much a soul ballad at its core, and Pino would have been given a chord progression to follow as he created this line. We're going to look at four main sections. We have the intro, the verse, the pre-chorus, and the chorus. Pino plays around a little on the repeats, but we'll stick to the first time through. The song's in F, and the bass line from the intro sounds like this. So let's just work through that bass line first and then we'll look at the harmony. I'm using a Squire Vintage Mod fretless jazz today, but obviously Pino was well known for using his Music Man Stingray fretless. I'm using the bridge pickup with the tone rolled back to get closer to the sound, but there's obviously no substitute for that Music Man. So we start on an F, first fret of the uh, E string, and we're just outlining the groove here with... So we've got one, two, and three. And then we have this little fill to lead us into the next chord, the B flat. So we're gonna be moving from the F up to the G there. So that's gonna be third to the fifth fret on the D string. And then we come down, F, C, so third fret, D string and A string. And then we have the F to the G, first to the third fret on the E string to lead us up into that B flat. So. Then for the second bar, we're just outlining the groove again on that B flat, first fret of the A string. And then again on that third uh, bar. And then we have this. <laughs> We've got the B flat at the third fret of the G string sliding up slowly to the C at the fifth fret. So it's that, <laughs> it's that really cool move there that, you know, stands out in the mix so much. So, and then we're landing on the C third fret of the A string and just playing the groove again. Now it's just worth mentioning that after that first bar, after the, when we get to the B flat and beyond there, um, all of a sudden the actual groove there, the notes are played fairly staccato and detached, so as opposed to, okay, so he's, he's playing those fairly staccato, and it gives the uh, the feel a little, which I'll talk about later, but it gives the uh, the groove a little bit of a different feel, a little bit more agitated and a bit more tense. 
okay? So now let's look a little deeper into what's going on here. And when you do this, you want to look at the chord progression uh, because that's what he's working through. So uh, we're in the key of F major. The first chord is F. Then we've got B flat, then C, then back to F. So that's chords one, four, and five in F major, basic primary chords. And um, it pays to know the chord progression and the arpeggios of each chord. So we want to know F major, B flat major, C major, and F major. So for the uh, F major chord, we've got F, A, and C, which here I'm just playing as first fret on the E string, open A string, and then the C at the third fret, then B flat, same pattern up, so B flat, D, F, so first fret, A string, open D string, and then the third fret of the D string, and then you just move it up to the C, so third fret on the uh, A string, E and G, so that's second fret and fifth fret on the, uh, on the D string, so we're just moving that just moving that pattern around. So let's say you were given that chord progression and had to create a bass line in this style. So what would you do? Well, first things first, you'd want to know the drum beat and feel. So let's have a listen to that drum beat. So here we have that repeating bass drum figure. One, two, and three. One, two, and three. And uh, you can hear the snare is there on two and four, and we've got that 16th note hi-hat uh, rhythm. So, the most obvious thing there would be to just follow that bass drum. So. So, Pino does do that, but then adds a bunch of interesting fills and variations. The first bar contains that memorable fill. So, this is a really popular way of playing around a major chord. We've got the F up to the G. So, the chord's F major, we're playing the root note, moving up to the second and back. It's a neighbor note function. So, and you'll hear this loads of times, especially in ballads. You'll get these kind of fills. You just get that all the time. So it just takes the root note, moves slightly to the side, comes back, and that's that. So then he comes back down, root note, and the fifth, so. So he's outlining the chord tones there, and then we have F, G, leading up into the B flat. So this is, if you think of the F and the G afterwards, that part, that is actually looking at the next chord, the B flat, we're leading into it with a very soul type move. So you'll know that kind of fifth to sixth kind of move as this. You know, that kind of, you get that all the time in soul tunes and that's pretty much what we've got here. So if you think of the first part, that's all a part of the F major chord, but this, that F and the G leading up, that's actually looking at the B flat and actually thinking, okay, well, that's the fifth and the sixth of the B flat leading in. So think of that as an approach to the B flat in a very soul wise, soul -wise manner. You know, it's got that feel. For the next bar, obviously we're just playing the groove with that staccato feel. And then in the third bar, again, We've got that cool little move. Now, all that's happening here is we're just outlining the chord move from B flat to C. That's all it is. But because he plays up the octave with that with that fretless uh, fretless slide, it really jumps out in the mix and it turns something uh, that is incredibly basic and simple into something that is still basic and simple, but it just jumps out and gives it a lot more melodic, uh, uh, a lot more melodicism. So. just adds a lot more spice into the mix. So these fills are really the melodic interest in that intro. And uh, you know, it doesn't get in the way of any of the other instruments. You know, the bass is the melodic feature in a lot of this tune. And it's this kind of tasteful melodic playing that catapulted Pino to session bass stardom in the 80s. So we're only four bars into the tune and we've already got an instantly memorable bass line. The fact that Pino plays that fill in the first bar sets the scene for what's to come. So next we're into the verse riff, which sounds like this. Thank you. 
So this verse is eight bars in length and we're just following the chord progression again. So the chord progression is F major, then we've got the A minor, then we've got the B flat, and then we've got the C major. So it's a chord uh, one, then three, four, and five. So the, uh, the comp pattern here is gonna be. So we've got this dotted eighth note, sixteenth note, so one E and A. And then we've got the eighth note rest, eighth note. So it's a very common rhythm, this of one. Okay, and then hitting on three. So one E and A two and three. Okay, but you know, if you listen to the groove, you'll be able to get it, you know, but there's the count if you need it. So we've got. Okay, so each of these notes is going to be staccato again, so fairly short. And we work up through it, so we've got the F, then the A, so I'm using the open A. Then the B flat, first fret of the A string. Then up to the C, third fret of the A string. And then we've got that cool little fill. So for the fill, we have... So we've got the C to the D there, so I'm just hammering on for this, so that's 5th fret to the 7th fret on the G string. Then we've got the G, 5th fret of the D string. And then we've got... So we've got C, F, C, 3rd fret on the A and the D string. So... And then back down to the F, okay? So we're on the C, so... So they're all 16th notes there at the end, so. So then we work through that chord progression again. F, A, B flat, C, and then we've got this cool little, this cool little chordal fill, these uh, little double stops here. So we only play the first three notes of the C, so. Then we jump up and we have this slide uh, with a, basically a perfect fourth here. So it's on the uh, 17th to the 19th fret, you slide up. And then, I mean, you can use whichever finger. I'm using the third finger here. So you just slide up to the 19th fret. So you're barring across the 17th fret on the D and G string, up to the 19th fret, then back to that 17th fret. It's quite hard to keep the intonation here with this uh, cutaway in the way. And then same thing again, but this time on the, uh, the 17th and 15th frets. So, oops. So. So that's the double stops there. So delving a little deeper, remember the chord progression was F major, A minor, then B flat, and then C. Again, you wanna know the arpeggios, the chord tones for all of these chords, and bear in mind, you really wanna know the chord tones for those chords all over the fretboard. So we start on the F and we just work up, I mean, it's just root notes through all of those until we get to the C on both times. Uh, and then when we have this, Again, remember we're on the C, the C major, we have that little neighbor note. We've got the C up to the D, the fifth fret to the seventh fret there. Again, it's that root to second neighbor note. And then down to the G, which is the fifth of the chord. So, And then again, just as we did earlier on, we've got the... Uh, we're using the notes of the next chord to lead into it. So this time we've got C, F, C, and then down into the F. So we're preempting the F. So the first part is C, so, and then we're leading in with those notes of the F. Because you could look at those as the C, you know, C major, we've got the root note, and then we've got the fourth, but the fourth doesn't fit. But that's because we're preempting the F. We're leading into it, just as you would with you know, with chromatic passing notes or any kind of approach notes, you know. It's just using the notes of that next chord to lead into it. And again, that move is very reminiscent of soul bass lines played by people like James Jameson. You know, that kind of fifth octave, fifth root, very Jameson based. But then this, this top part, that's very Pino with that neighbor note up on the top. Then for the double stops at the end, the way to analyze this is to look at the top note. The top note in a chord is the melody note. It's the soprano note in the chord. So what we have here is, so 
again, we've got that little root note to the second and back, just as we had here. And on the, so we've got, there's the C for that C major chord, up to the D and back, and then, then we've got the G, F, G, that's the fifth down to the fourth and back. Again, a neighbor note, this time it's a lower neighbor note. So up a neighbor note, and then lower. But we're just harmonizing it with a note, a fourth below. So, so below we've got the G to the A, so, whoops. Like I say, hard to get in there. And then, again, we're just playing that fourth harmony there. So it's the top note that you're really listening out for. Next, we reach the toughest part of the tune, the pre-chorus, which sounds like this. Again, let's work through the notes here. So we begin on a D, 10th fret of the, uh, of the E string, that's for a quarter note, then we have a 16th note rest, and then we come up through this fill. So that's gonna be D, A, E, and F. So that's gonna be 10th fret um, E string, obviously. A, the 12th fret of the A string, and then we've got this E and F at the 9th and 10th frets of the G string. And there's multiple different ways you can play this. Um, I was playing it originally as up here, but it probably makes more sense to actually play it down here. I don't know where Pino played it. <laughs> he could have played it anywhere, but it's just a lot easier to play it in this uh, in this position. So, so we've got one E and a two E and a. So then we're on this F, and then we have this little 16th note triplet of G, F, E, so, which I play all of those pull uh, as pull-offs. So I've got the fourth finger there on the G, and the 12th fret of the G string. I'm holding down the second and first fingers on the F and the E at the 10th and 9th fret, so they're all held down, and then, so you just pull off through them, okay? So, and then back down to the A at the 12th fret of the A string, so, You've got the triplet, and then back down to the D at the 10th fret of the E string. So, so one, two. After the D, we have the A at the 12th fret of the A string. So that is the root note of the next chord, but the way that this works, it's kind of like a continuation of that melody. Okay, uh, which is another one of the cool melodic uh, aspects of this entire bass line, that continuation of it into the next bar, so. Okay, and then we have the open A string briefly, so one, two, and, and then we have, we've got these two double stops again, so this is going to be 17th fret on the D string and 15th fret on the G string. That minor third pattern, which we slide down to the E and the G there. So that's going to be the 14th fret on the D string and the 12th fret on the G string. So, so we've just got that little slide. Now you can play that with your first and third finger or the first and second fingers. For some reason, I like playing it with the first and second fingers. Okay, then we drop down to the B flat, the root note of the next chord, sixth fret of the E string. And then we're up to the B. 7th fret of the E string, and then we've got this cool little fill. So we play the B, 1, 2, add, and then we've got... And then back down into the F, so this is on a B diminished. So we've got the F, so we've got... So F at the 10th fret of the G string, then we've got the B at the 9th fret of the uh, D string, and then back up to the D at the, uh, uh, what's that, 7th fret of the G string. So then we drop down to that uh, A flat there at the 6th uh, fret of the D string, and then down to the F natural at the 8th uh, fret of the A string. I normally just look at these as notes. I always get confused looking at the actual frets here. So, so. And then we have B, A flat, so that's gonna be 9th fret, 6th fret again on the D string, and then we have the open D string that helps us to move back down into the F. You could come down to the D at the 5th fret of the A string, but uh, it makes more sense to actually use the, the uh, open D string, so. 
Okay, so that's our wicked diminished line. So, and we'll talk about that in a sec. So that leads us into the chorus. So let's just go through those four bars very slowly. So we've got three, four. Obviously, you want to take all of that pretty slowly. You know, when you're working on that D, you know, just take your time on it. You know, start, get the rhythm correct. So, one, two, you know, coming down with those pull offs and then into the A, you got that string skip. So, and then. Very slowly. Just take your time with it. So, what's going on here? Well, first of all, we need to look at the chord progression. So, we have D minor, or D minor 7 into A minor. Then we move into B flat major, and then to a B diminished 7. Okay, so one bar each there. So what are those chords? Well, that D minor, that is chord six in F major. Remember in the key of F major, that's chord six. But what's happening here is that it's kind of a temporary modulation to um, D minor. I mean, it's not a full modulation. We've not changed key. You've just moved to that D minor area. And then the A minor acts as a chord five of that. So it just helps to reinforce that, uh, that D minor. And then when we reach the B flat, well, we're back into the F major and we're making an ascent as if we're going to maybe move to C to come back. But instead of that, as the cadence back into F, we have this B diminished seven, which is a very common move, which you'll hear in a lot of blues and jazz tunes, especially ones like Georgia on my mind, you get this kind of diminished chord leading into back into the F. And the reason for that, the reason it works, is because of the chord tones in the B diminished. They sit nicely next to the notes of the F and there's a lot of tension there and they want to resolve. So it's all about the voice leading. So don't worry about it too much. Just know that that's a B diminished seven and you really want to know the arpeggio. So you're going to want to learn the arpeggios there. So we've got the D minor or D minor seven, which is D, F, A, and C. So here in terms of the fingering. We've got 5th fret and 8th fret on the uh, A string, then we've got the 7th fret on the D string and the 5th fret on the G string. And, uh, you know, that, <laughs> that fingering doesn't really uh, correspond to any of the notes really in this, uh, you know, this thing. But, uh, you know, really you want to just know that the notes are D, F, A and C. Then we've got A minor. Again, you can just take that finger in and move it down to the uh, down to the A. B flat, we've already looked at. But then for the B diminished, or B diminished 7, we've got B, D, F, and then A flat. That's the four notes in there. So I'm playing the second fret and the fifth fret on the, uh, on the A string there, and then the third fret and the sixth fret on the uh, D string. And it gives you this very symmetrical kind of look, or, or a very distinctive look, where we've got this minor third, and then same minor third but just up a fret on the next string. It's actually consecutive minor thirds. So we've got and it's a very very distinctive sound. So that's the B diminished 7. So what's happening in the bass line? Well we're on the D minor so it's got the root note, the fifth, but then it's leading up via a passing note, that, that E, into that, that note at the top, the F, which is the minor third. So that minor third in there on the minor chord is the main characterful note in there. So he's outlining the minor character of that D minor. So, so that's where all the melodicism comes in there. Then he's coming down with the G, F, E into the A. So we're landing eventually on the A, another chord tone, the fifth of the chord, and then dropping down to the root note. Uh, but then the cool part about this is that he then leads back into the A. So he's played A, D, A. First time it's the fifth of the chord, and then the second time it's the root. Okay? Now he could have played. 
then played the low A, but he doesn't. He plays this high A, and because of that, it sounds like an extension of that melody. It's a part of that. We're continuing the melody there rather than just dropping down to the root note on beat one. He doesn't. He stays up there, and that's that's what just gives it that melodicism up there. Then we have the open A and these these two uh, these two double stops here that are pretty strange in that they're actually outlining uh, an enclosure of the uh, of the A. So we're on an A minor, but we're playing B flat and G, okay, on the top, and then G and E on the uh, on the bottom of the chord. So G and E are both chord tones. So they're both a part of that A minor seven, but the B flat and the G are just basically. That's that's an enclosure of that A, okay? So, but if we put that on the bottom, okay, it just gives it that slightly odd sound. Then, obviously, for the B flat, just root notes, and then the B natural, we've got the B diminished. Remember what I said about this? We're gonna be using, we're gonna be using the B diminished seven arpeggio. This fill outlines the B diminished seven chord tones. So any of you wondering if Pino Palladino has a grasp of music theory, here it is. Remember that Joe Hubbard video that I mentioned? This is where you get to see some of the knowledge that he will have acquired through those lessons and through some of the songs that he transcribed. Joe mentions Fantasia by uh, Harvey Mason. That tells you the kind of material that Pino would be working on. Diminished patterns like this one are way more prevalent in jazz than pop music. And this fill shows a really good knowledge of that diminished seven arpeggio because the pattern that he uses isn't so obvious. It isn't, you know, an ascending or descending arpeggio. You know, he isn't just moving up and down it. It's not even a sequence. It's a really interesting move through the notes. So if we were to look at the B diminished in that position, we've got the B, we've got the D and the F. So that's that's the diminished triad. Okay, so I've got the ninth fret on the D string and then the seventh and tenth frets on the G string. So if you look at that move there, well, the run that he plays starts on that flat five. So we've got... So he's got a flat five and then a root and a third, okay? So instantly, it's, you know, it's not starting on the root note of the of the diminished, it's starting on the flat five. And the way that it's moving, it's, it's the kind of exercise that someone like Joe Hubbard would give you where you're running arpeggios in different permutations, you know, different permutations of the chord tones. So we've got five, one, three. And then we've got that, that diminished seventh or the you know the major six that's in there coming down to the down to that flat five down here so and then root note down to that diminished seventh and then the root no, uh, sorry the D there so it's just a really interesting line you know it, it's not standing on the root note it starts on that flat five and just the way that it, it ascends and then it descends, you know, it's it's an interesting line. And like I said, it would be the kind of line that you would learn in a an exercise, let's say. So now we're into the chorus, which sounds like this. So again, we're outlining the chord progression. We start on an F, just doubling that groove there, the bass drum, one, two, and three. Then we've got this little skip of a ghost note, and then we've got the two eighth notes, C, C sharp, D. So third, fourth, and fifth frets on the A string. So that's leading into the D minor, so. Again, we're outlining that, um, that groove there, and then we have, We've got this A to the um, B flat and back, which you can do with the pinky there. So, so that's the seventh to eighth fret and back. So, so try not to over skip it, and then and you can put a little bit 
vibrato on that. So that's the G then, the next uh, root note of the chord. So we've got the seventh to eighth to seventh fret and then down to the fifth fret, okay? Then we drop down to the G at the third fret of the E string. So, and then C, C, C. Then it's the same again. And then we've got this awesome fill. So we've got... So here we've got the A there, the seventh fret of the D string, and we're gonna keep coming back to that. That's a little pedal point. So we've got... So F, E, and D up on the top. Tenth, ninth, and uh, seventh frets. So... So each time we're coming back to that seventh fret on the D string. And then we just have F, A, eighth fret, A string, seventh fret on the D string, and then moving down or sliding down, down to the fifth fret, the G again, uh, of the uh, fifth fret of the D string. So that's the root note of the G again, exactly like we did it last time, and then dropping down to the G uh, to finish off that groove on that bar. So we've got... And then just C. So very slowly, the whole thing. So what's going on here? Well, the chord progression is F major, then D minor, G minor, and then C major. So it's one, six, two, five in F major, incredibly common chord sequence. So we start on that root note, and then the C and the C sharp leads us into the next chord, into the D. So this is a chromatic passing note, so a chromatic approach note. So we've got C, C sharp, D, incredibly common move. You'll see this in lots of bass lines by people like James Jameson and loads of other people. It's just a standard way of getting, let's say from that F up to that D, you just approach from two frets below. You could approach from two frets above as well, okay? So it's just a way of approaching the D. Then when we're on the D, we have this cool little so that is the fifth to the flat six there. So that's just a neighbor note again. Remember what I said about the, you know, the first to the second and back? Well, this is the fifth to the sixth and back. Anytime you take a chord tone and then move up to the next scale note or down to the next scale note and back, that's a neighbor note function. So, which then leads us into the root note of G. Then obviously we just, just chord tones, the root notes there. Second time round, all the same, but then when we get to that fill, we are on the D minor chord, and this A that we're using as the pedal point to move back to, that's the fifth of the chord. So remember that, you know, if you want to do anything like this in your own bass lines, if you take that fifth of the chord, you can use it, you know, as a, uh, as a little pedal point. So it's very baroque in its feel this it's you know very bark sounding so we've got the f the e and the d on the top so that's third second first so on the d so so again we're just outlining the chord tones the d there is a passing note between them but you could just think of a scale there a d uh, minor scale so so then we have the F, A, and then down to the G, third, fifth, so again, chord tones of the of the D minor, leading us nicely into the G. So it's just beautiful the way that that works. Just with that F, A, which is an enclosure of the root notes in the next chord. So just wonderful playing there to actually, you know, then move into the G an octave higher and then just descend nicely down onto the lower octave to settle the groove. So, and we're back in. But again, just as when we he played on the D minor at the top, he's extending the melody by landing with a higher note on the first uh, beat of the of the next bar. So. You know, there's that 
one instead of landing on the G, uh, the low G that is. Okay, so what can we learn from this line? Well, Pino keeps the groove pumping at all times, but then he makes use of these interesting melodic, um, you know, these melodic ideas to transition between chords and to add some character to the line. As you can hear, these are not throwaway fills or runs. They are very melodic and they add character to the entire song. If you practice those lines and try playing along, you know, around with them rhythmically, you should be able to incorporate them into your own playing. Pay special attention to how each line relates to the chord. Learn those arpeggios and see the chord tones for every chord that you play through, you know, at all times. And as Pino shows here, you don't need to stick to that low register. Move around the fretboard a little if you want to catch the ear, but always think melodically. Pino sings through his instrument with these lines. The very vocal in nature and the fretless bass really reinforces that style. Okay, so I hope you liked this little breakdown. Please like the vid if it's helped, subscribe to the channel, then check out the website for over 600 lessons just like this one, all organized and systemized on the lesson map for ease of navigation. Then sign up for free to gain access to the totally free Talking Bass membership where you'll find free ebooks, practice resources, chat rooms, forums, and much more. There's also a wide variety of premium courses on everything from beginner bass to harmony to reading to slap bass to technique, chords, and much, much more. So check it out and I'll see you next week.